discussions I would love to have been in the Brown Derby where Clark Gable reportedly proposed to Carol Lombard. So sit back and relax while we take you back in time to that famous restaurant in this segment of More Things That Aren't Here Anymore on member supported KCET. made a very good bowl of chili and he made that into a very fancy restaurant it became a favorite of the movie colony what they call the lifestyle of the rich and famous but now chasen's restaurant is just a boarded up memory and so is perino's and so is scandia and so is the tale of the cock and vickman's and dozens and dozens of others and that's my point restaurants are a risky business of all the things that aren't here anymore, restaurants are the most. So where should we begin? Well, probably with the most famous restaurant in the history of Los Angeles, and the most illogical. I mean, who wants to eat in a hat? A derby hat, a brown derby hat. What I remember about it was very Hollywood looking. I mean, in, in terms of uh, kind of dark colors, um, but comfortable. Maybe elegant, shabby. <laughs> they had a booth where if you wanted to get a rumor started in Hollywood, you'd sit in this particular booth, and the way the room was shaped, everybody on the opposing side heard what you said. I remember the waitresses. They were all very, very beautiful. And the rumor was, and I'm sure it's quite true, that they had come to Hollywood to be in the movies and didn't make the grade or were waiting to be discovered or something. The Brown Derby starred in 27 movies, which is more than most of the stars who ate there. And it was so successful, owner Bob Cobb duplicated his hat-shaped hot spot in Hollywood. This one wasn't shaped like a derby at all, but it was an even greater success. And it soon became the place where the movers and shakers of show business met every day for lunch. You know, there were some very famous booths at the Derby. One of them happens to be where Clark Gable proposed to Carol Lombard. And if you, you know, if you were a romantic couple, they would seek you there. Above those private booths were pictures, caricatures of the stars who ate there. And as the story goes, the Derby's maitre d' was fond of the Hollywood gossip columns. He knew everything and anything about his celebrity clientele. And if a marriage broke up or a romance broke up and you, your caricatures were side by side on the wall, he would discreetly move one of them away and put somebody else there. Or add that one if you were now dating, so you'd come in and sit in the booth under your own caricatures. Jimmy uh, Durante was the only star who had two uh, frames on the wall for his caricature. One for him and one for the knows. While the Tinseltown regulars gathered to be seen, perhaps the biggest star to come out of the Brown Derby was a salad, the Cobb salad. Actually, owner Bob Cobb came up with this concoction for two of his best customers, movie executive Irving Thalberg, who had digestion problems, and his movie star wife Norma Shearer, who was watching her weight. Voila, a salad is born. This is the story as it goes. He went to the kitchen and he started. Now, if you chop up on everything very, very small, a baby could digest it. Irving can digest it. And if you serve it in a rainbow on the plate before it's mixed, a person on a diet can leave out the things that are fattening. And frequently, the MGM limousine would pull up and pick up two of the Cobb salads and deliver them back to the studio. But the showbiz crowd changed its taste, and the old brown hat went out of style and never came back. Fast times were giving way to fast food, and the derby couldn't keep up. A whole new era of eating had emerged. Los Angeles was falling in love with the drive-in. And there was a particular hamburger joint out in San Bernardino that isn't here anymore. But what it started is still very much with us. A cheap, cheerful meal on the run. By the time we were in cars, we would come down here, 
and you would pack the car up with as many people as you could, and then you would buy the 12 hamburgers, and you would feast for a dollar. And, of course, you'd try to get um, French fries. You'd really like to get a chocolate milkshake, which were wonderful, but if you couldn't, you'd get water. The owners were two brothers, and nearly 50 years ago, they were selling hamburgers faster than they could cook them. They only charged 12 cents apiece. Their name was McDonald's. For a while, their little drive-in was the social and culinary center of San Bernardino. It wasn't a mystique, it was the food they served. And they moved it out fast. Who ever heard of a malted milkshake having six of them at each station, which means they had 36 malted milks cracking up at one time. The McDonald brothers bought those milkshake mixers from a fellow named Ray Kroc, who speeded up the assembly line and then franchised the idea. The fast food revolution was suddenly on its way, golden arches and all. Well, when it was all said and done, they really didn't give the original McDonald's much of a break. The little drive-in was torn down in 1972. Today, only a small plaque remembers the billions of burgers it gave birth to. restaurant a hit or a miss. Well, as any real estate dealer will tell you, it's location, location, location. Which explains why the Rex isn't with us anymore. The Rex was not exactly handy. You had to take a water taxi three miles out into Santa Monica Bay, cost 25 cents, and then climb aboard a beautiful old sailing freighter, which had been converted at considerable expense into a gambling casino. Well, no big thing today, but before World War II, this was major news. And there were similar ships moored off Redondo and Long Beach, an armada of sin was on the horizon, and a thousand sinners a night were floating out to shoot dice and spin the wheel. You see these white boats out there, and they had flags flying, and we knew what they were. There was gossip, you know. And at night, they were all lighted. So you could see these beautiful twinkly lights that were very festive, very glamorous looking, and very wicked sounding. Your host was a handsome, well-dressed fellow named Tony Cornero, who had made a bundle smuggling booze during Prohibition. Tony had charm and he had money, but his reputation left a lot to be desired. I mean, he was not a member of the Jonathan Club, if you get what I mean. If they were gangsters, they didn't look like the ones portrayed in the movies. I mean, like James Cagney or Edward G. Robinson, nothing like that. But uh, we thought it was a lot of fun. And no amount was too small to gamble. A nickel, a dime, quarter, anything. I've seen people in a roulette for nickels. <laughs> The gambling ships were a great success and a great adventure, but they made one little mistake. They lured the gamblers away from the gambling on shore, away from the Sunset Strip and Santa Anita. So Mayor Fletcher Bowerin organized the police and the feds to attack the ships with fire hoses. And that was the famous Battle of Santa Monica Bay, where Tony Cornero said, I will not give up the ship. But later he did anyway, and that was that. The whole kit and caboodle was deep six. As for Tony Cornero and all those sinners, well, they retreated to a place on dry land called Las Vegas. This doesn't rhyme, but one of these days soon we'll be seeing you. In the meantime, this is Bob Wolf thanking you for those letters to commence. Hey, the now there's a familiar voice. And you know, we used to really pay attention to these radios. I mean, that was not just audible wallpaper. In the early television sets, we really watched them. They were more than electronic furniture. Now they're, they're all empty. The faces and voices that made these come to life are also things that aren't here anymore. Seem to me we should pay attention to some important people of Los Angeles.
The first live televised dancing show 